Welcome to the Lorecast, where we look into the lore and stories by which we live. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist, and you can find us at chalkwist.com slash podcast. We're talking today about grief, loss, and something that we could call no-till emotionality. So let me start by explaining that last. My friend and colleague Linda Bizell and I have a number of eco-related interests. In fact, it was my friend Linda who got me introduced to ecotherapy many years ago. We're both trained as permaculture designers, which means we're interested in designing uh, sources of food that mimic those in the natural world. So for instance, in nature, you don't see straight rows of crops. You see guilds instead, groups of plants that like to grow together. Linda and I also have a background in eco-psychology, which is the parent field of ecotherapy. So we were talking some years ago about how strange it is that some emotions are allowed to run their full course and some are not. So for example, uh, at least in our culture, if you feel joy or happiness, Nobody worries about it and says, wow, I, I might be feeling this for too long. Maybe I better stop feeling it. <laughs> I'm, now that I think of it, there are a handful of people who do have that worry because they can't let themselves be joyful. But for the most part, positive emotions, as we like to call them, uh, aren't considered problems. But the worry that a lot of people have about sadness, grief, loss, anger, emotions that are widely considered negative wrongly in my opinion, those get a different kind of treatment from us. Those are the ones that provoke questions like, well, what if I get lost in grief? What if I am plunge into an ocean of grief? And what do I need to do to work through grief, loss, or sadness? And nobody asks that about happiness. You don't work through happiness, right? So it's odd, this double standard that we have. And in part, it comes from an arbitrary labeling of some emotions as good and some as bad, which is a bit like saying that there's good or bad plants in nature. It's, it doesn't really make any sense when you think about it. So there's a farming method called no-till, and what it means is instead of digging down into the ground and disrupting the web of ecological relations down there, um, mixing everything up in a way that sometimes hurts the land wouldn't it be better just to pile nutrients in layers on top of each other and then grow plants in that instead so you're actually feeding the soil and of course this this is done all over the world um, many examples of it uh, it got popular in the US a while back by being called lasagna gardening but there's other examples of it as well and so the idea is to replace digging down with building up. And Linda and I wrote a piece about no-till therapy where we talked about, speculated about what would it look like when people come in and they're grieving, they've had a lot of loss, to not encourage them to dig down into it or work through it, but just to be with it, which some therapists actually do. But interestingly, there's a gap between what we're trained to do and what we actually do. I know this from my own therapy experience. And so some years ago, I lost both my fathers in the same year, my birth father and my adoptive father. Uh, my adoptive one I had grown up with. My birth father I had met later in my 20s. And um, didn't see him that much, but he came to mean a lot to me. And <clears throat> so they both died in the same year. And I can't tell you how often well-meaning therapist friends of mine said, oh, this is just a huge loss. This is staggering. Um, do you need some kind of therapy? Are you okay? 
And I remember thinking, why would I need therapy? Because I lost somebody. And I told them, I'm fine. Um, I'm sad a lot, of course, because I've had these huge losses, but I'm grieving. I, I, there's nothing wrong with me, you know. So even among therapists who should know better, there's this habit of intervention of we need to come, we need to come in and fix things, you know. So this raises a good question. When would an intervention be appropriate? And I would say if grieving is interfering with your life to the point where you can't get out of bed or um, you can't go to work or whatever it is that you need to do that you can't do, um, it's interfering with your ability to parent if you're a parent, then there might be an inter intervention necessary. But even then, there has to be some discernment. There are plenty of cultures where grieving people are not expected to do those sorts of things. The family or the village looks after them until their grieving passes on its own schedule. And, and that's exactly the consideration that I want to bring to the surface in this podcast, which is that grief and loss have their own schedule, not the one we impose on it. So somebody was telling me recently that in her workplace, you get I guess a week to grieve a major loss and a day to grieve whatever a minor loss is, according to the company, not the person. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Who's to say how long it takes? And what about people, and I used to be one of these, who spend years not grieving when they should grieve and they store it all up because you can. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I've mentioned before that... Uh, I grew up in a pretty abusive home, pretty violent home, and there was no grieving allowed, and I didn't shed a tear from the time I was five until I was in my late 20s, early 30s. That's a long time to not cry, not grieve, not have any conscious sense of loss. And so I remember the day when I was in a therapy session, in my therapy, and this was while I was training as a psychotherapist. You have to have your own therapy, which, of course, you should. And um, my therapist and I were talking about all these losses and how I had never really grieved any of it. And she said, what are your dreams like? <clears throat> and I said, well, here I am, you know, going through a divorce and I just moved out. And, you know, I'm in touch with my soon-to-be ex to make sure that this isn't totally destabilizing for her on her end of it. And um, my dreams are bringing me these huge rainstorms. And my therapist chuckled and said, okay, so here's what you need to do. You need to get your apartment set up and your bills online as quickly as possible because it will come, the grief will come. So as I recall, this was in the... Oh, I think it was 1994. It was quite a while ago. <laughs> and um, it hadn't rained in a while. And so I was laying on the couch of my new apartment. And it started to pour outside. And I felt moisture on my face. And I, th at first I thought, is the rain leaking in through the windows or the roof? And then I realized that the moisture was coming out of me. That's how alienated I was from my own feelings and my own body. And so then the, da the downpour came. <laughs> and um, for the first year, I think I cried every night. For the second year, I probably cried every other night at least. And by the third year, it was sporadic and I was feeling a, a lot lighter. <laughs> so um, I know from my own experience and then from working with clients and then from just seeing it in other people, that when you don't grieve, it, it stays with you until you get rid of it, especially when it's a series of losses. One of the things I learned from that, and I'm grateful to that therapist for helping me learn this, is that when you are in grief, you should be in it fully. Not going somewhere with it, not trying to work on it, um, not trying to take it in this or that direction, but trusting it to have its own schedule, momentum, um, agenda, whatever you want to say about it. The grief knows what it's doing. And there may be times when you have to shut that door on it 
because you have to work. Um, it wouldn't have been good for me to sit there at my desk weeping all day. So there were times when I had to shut it off, which was suppression rather than repression. Repression is more like the unconscious kind where you put it in the unconscious and forget about it. But even so, to trust that your feelings know what they're doing and, and have their own momentum the way seasons do, the way the daily cycles do, that's what Linda and I were talking about in our article on no-till therapy, and that's what I'm raising here about no-till emotionality in general, especially with regard to so-called negative feelings. Can we trust them enough to do what they need to do? Can we respect them and ourselves enough to give them the space they need? And can we be brave and discerning enough to realize that the emotions aren't going to drown us. It's not like being in the sea. If we let them loose in appropriate situations, they'll take care of themselves. And we need to let them do that if we want to move forward in life. And so here's a thought from Freud. And let me say up front that um, I have very mixed feelings about Freud's work, as a lot of people do. Um... I actually think he was more of a philosopher than a psychologist, frankly. But he was a philosopher with occasional deep insights into human nature. And one of the things Freud gave us was the idea cast in psychological form that when you don't grieve, um, let's use the example of somebody who has died. When you don't grieve for them, one of your feet stays in the grave with them. There's a part of you that dies and doesn't come back until you grieve. And so you get stuck to the grief. You get stuck to the loss that you've been through. And it's only by grieving that you can start to move in a different direction. And you never lose the sense of loss entirely. Um, at this point, I'm in my late 50s, and so I've lost bunches of family members, uh, some friends along the way too, and uh, I miss them. And I'm going to miss them until the day I die and maybe after. So uh, that part doesn't go away. But it doesn't. it's not an open wound all the time. It's, uh, it's something that aches occasionally on a, on a fall night when it's cool and I'm thinking about my ancestors and my relatives who've gone on before me. And I, f I feel like I miss them a lot and sometimes get sad. But it's not an open wound. I'm not stuck in the grave with them. And Freud was in a position to know because during the first, the, at the end of the First World War, actually, he lost his favorite daughter, Sophie. She died of a battlefield disease while she was doing relief work. And that devastated Freud. So he understood what he was talking about in terms of grief and loss. He also lost sisters in the Holocaust, by the way, which was a, a huge... Um, loss for him and then toward the end of his life uh, Hitler and the Gestapo drove him out of Vienna so he lost his homeland as well he ended up moving to London so he knew about loss so for my own part I don't trust anything Freud says about feminine psychology but I do trust him on loss because he had been through so much of it and he understood it Now, a complicating factor in all this is when personal loss combines with collective loss. And uh, right now, um, as I'm broadcasting this, there's a number of losses going on, not only around the world, but here in the United States. And there's a lot of people grieving for various reasons. Collective situations of grief, not just personal, although they have personal implications as well. Among our losses are losses of rights, which uh, our current leadership doesn't seem inclined to really take seriously or do anything about. So where that could lead is nowhere good, as we've seen from history plenty of times. <clears throat> so it, this brings up the question of how do I deal with collective grief as well as my own? And I think realizing that it is collective is part of managing it because where we get in trouble is when we take on griefs or other emotional states that are bigger than we are 
And we think that it's purely personal suffering when in fact it's the suffering of an entire group of people or even of the planet itself, if we want to go wide with this. So when we're facing that kind of grief and loss, we need support. It's really not possible to do this alone. There's a kind of go-it-alone, heroic mentality here in the States. And I'm going to be talking, by the way, about the shadow of the hero pretty soon in these podcasts. It's a dreadful shadow, it's, um, it, and it's dangerous. But in any case, we have this idea that I should be able to handle it. I should be able to do it myself. And you can't. We're social beings by nature. And we share each other's emotions all the time. So it's really necessary to get support from understanding people when you're going through a time of collective peril like we are uh, through multiple factors. There's all kinds of things impinging on us right now. So it's really important to get support of some kind with it. Not the working through kind of therapy support, although that can be useful too, but more just being around people who resonate to the same collective sense of what's happening and understand it. I can't tell you how many times students have come up to me and to use one example, other people have too, and said, I'm going nuts about climate change. I, I grew up in a certain place and it's different. You know, I all I have to do is walk outside. I don't even need to look at the science, you know. Things are burning up all over the states and in other countries. Um, the weather's going haywire and I'm freaking out about it. And I always tell them the same thing. You need support. You need to be joining up with other people who have the same experience that you do, the same perceptions, and who are not in denial and running away from realizing all this. Something else to realize about grief and loss and sadness and anger and other emotions that we sometimes prefer not to have is that the capacity for emotion is a bit like the capacity for sight in the sense that when you're looking at a landscape you don't get the choice of not seeing red or green or blue or what have you um, you don't get the choice of, of tuning out specific colors your eye takes all of it in or none of it and in the same way you don't get the choice of I'm going to feel these emotions, but not those. So if you've done something to your capacity for grief and shut it down, you're going to notice pretty soon that there's other emotions, more pleasant ones, that you can't feel either. Your capacity for happiness and joy, for instance, will eventually be diminished. So in order to have a healthy emotional life, it's necessary to be open to everything. And it's okay to um, suppress some things temporarily, like I mentioned earlier. There are situations where you just can't deal with something that's coming up. But don't forget about it. You have to make time later so that it can service. And this, by the way, brings us into the realm of psychological energy or psychic energy, as it's called. That old term psychic shouldn't be confused with the people on the street corner who tell fortunes. It's not that kind of psychic. It's... It's shorthand for psychological. In any case, um, so it takes a lot of psychic energy to hold down grief and sadness, even if you're doing it unconsciously. So not only is your emotional life as a whole diminished, but you're using psychological resources to set something important out of action. And so you have less energy to play with than you would otherwise. It makes a difference. And Sometimes this can show up as a mild to moderate depression as well. So if you're feeling low in energy, that might be something to check out. Am I sitting on something? Have I not grieved in a, you know, for a situation that I should have grieved about? That's an important consideration. So when you do grieve, all the energy that you were using to keep that down is now liberated for other uses. And you'll find, too, that when you sit with grief a lot, it, too, has its own energy. It's, uh, at first, it feels a bit like a flood. <laughs> it comes pouring through you, and it can be scary at first. But when you let it do it, you get used to it. And so the energy of grief can actually be channeled 
when the time is appropriate into action. So that's something to realize as well, that in accessing grief because of loss or whatever it is that you're grieving about, you're accessing a double dose of psychic energy for use elsewhere. And you can feel this too. When you actually allow yourself to be in the center of grief, it's not moping. It's not being mired in grief at all. The grief, when you pay attention to it and really open yourself to it, starts to have its own momentum. It begins to move instead of being stuck. And you can feel it pouring through you. It's really a remarkable feeling. And it may take many times of that for the grief to spend itself. But every time that happens and it pours through you, you gain psychic energy. Now, let's talk a bit about loss. Um, here in the States, uh, I noticed that we have a hard time grieving and we have an even harder time with loss. And the two are somewhat different. <clears throat> when I mention loss, what I'm talking about is letting go. We have a terrible time letting go. And oftentimes, what we possess symbolically represents that. So thinking about how often those of us who have houses use our garage not to park our cars in, but to accumulate stuff that we never look at, but that to some extent we're psychologically tied to. And you can see this when you get rid of it. Um, after a relationship loss several months ago, I went through some things that I needed to get rid of, and it brought up a lot of feelings. And I thought, this is, this is why we hang on to stuff. No wonder we do this. So it's understandable. <clears throat> but, um, <laughs> and it's also privileged because we, <laughs> we have things to hang on to, right? So be that as it may, uh, loss is something that we have a hard time with. And this can take many different expressions. So I'm recalling a conversation I had with my dad before he died. And my dad and I didn't talk politics much because we are almost never agreed. And so we were watching a news story together on TV on this one occasion I'm thinking about. And it was some, you know, yet another massive failure in Washington. And um, he was cursing about it uh, under his breath. And so on an impulse, I pointed at the TV and I said, Dad, let me ask you something. <clears throat> These basic forms of U.S. federal government were invented in the 1700s. How in the world do we think that structures created back then have any chance of administrating a country as big as this one is in a world as complex as we live in now, hundreds of years later? Is it any wonder nothing works? And he chuckled and he said, well, what do you think we should do? And I said, we need to reinvent government from the ground up. So keep the principles, but create forms of government in which we can actually live those principles for a change instead of just talking about them all the time. And I think that might have been the one time when my dad actually agreed with me about something political. And like I said, we're on opposite sides. So, you know, I think... Probably the majority of people in this country recognize that things aren't going right, that, that it's being poorly led and administrated. Um, everybody has their own opinion about why. But I'm raising this because this is an example of holding on to something too long. And when you do that, it begins to decay. They mortify, to use an alchemical word. They become mortifying, <laughs> much like the news old belief systems that have become rigid, old worldviews, old ideologies that have been worn out for a long time. These are the kinds of things that we cling to. Old procedures, old institutions, old ways of doing things. Um, I work in higher ed, which means I work according to a model that's at least 800 years old and shows no sign of significantly changing anytime soon. I worked for one psychology school whose outdated therapeutic bias told them that teaching assistants shouldn't be allowed because of some old-fashioned notion about dual relationships that had absolutely no bearing whatsoever on what we do in school. 
I get contacted regularly by environmental organizations and nonprofits of different sorts who want to do really good work in the world. And then I go to their website and I look at who they are, who their staff is, who the leaders are and the administrators, and they're all white people. <laughs> this is what I mean by refusal to change, right? We hang on to things in this country way past their deadline, way past when we just need to let go. And the inability to grieve and the inability to let go reinforce each other because when we don't let go, we have more and more grieving to do and we fear it more and more because we know that once we do let go, it'll put us in a situation of uncertainty and loss. And you know what? As adults, that's where we have to be sometimes. Because no institute, no ideology, no sacred book is going to give us certainty about what the next steps are. Because there is no certainty. And we have to be able to tolerate that. We need the flexibility to move forward anyway, even though we don't know exactly where that will lead us. I'd like to pass along some advice I got from my very first psychotherapy instructor many years ago. He was speaking to a class of us who we're nervously awaiting seeing our first clients. And he said to us, don't worry so much about the safety stuff. You know how to identify suicidality and domestic violence, things like that, that you need to know how to spot. And so you've got that training. So don't worry so much about disasters and catastrophe. But what you should worry about is that fatal moment where you're in the room with somebody and you think you know exactly what's going on with them. Because when that happens, your sense of inquiry is dead. You are dead as a therapist. Always be in a state of uncertainty. And so that was his, uh, the motto that he gave our class, abandon certainty. That's a good motto, abandon certainty. We live in an uncertain, unpredictable trickster universe where certainty never rules, um, not even at the macro level, let alone the quantum realm. I grew up hearing all these confident science teachers talking about how most of the universe is made of this and most of the universe does that. Fast forward in 20 years and most of the universe is dark matter and energy and we don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> so even when we try to nail things down that way, they get away from us. Abandon certainty. So with these podcasts, because of the nature of the material that we deal with, I'm going to try to work in a suggestion for activity every now and then. And so for this podcast, my suggestion is this. Sit down and write down what you need to let go of. Inwardly, outwardly an aspect of your life, an attitude that no longer serves. What are you hanging on to that you need to let go of? That's something important to realize, pretty much at every step of the way, but maybe especially now when there's so much collective trauma happening. In times like that, it's easy to go in the opposite direction of sensitivity and to start loggering up, uh, especially inwardly. And defenses are a good thing, but they too can outlast their usefulness. So just to check in about what you need to let go of can be a very useful thing for liberating energy that you can put to other purposes. And if that means facing loss that you've been putting off for a while, then surf it. Swim in it. It'll carry you to a good place if you allow it to. If you can stay with it and keep your feet. On the other side of grief and loss are new people, new possibilities, new avenues for doing what you want to do in life rather than what you think you should do. So go explore them. See what's waiting for you out there. Because I think you'll find in the end that what's waiting for you out there is also waiting for you on the inside too. Thank you.